Welcome to a new episode of the Tolkien Experience Podcast. I'm Luke Shelton. I'm Sarah Westwick. And I'm Sarah Brown. Each episode, we share with you an interview of a Tolkien scholar or fan. That's right. In these interviews, one of us asks our guests to respond to six questions that help us learn about their personal Tolkien experience. All of this is made possible by our supporters on Patreon. So we want to thank them and encourage you to check out the community at patreon.com slash Tolkien experience. We are so excited to share this podcast with you. So without any more delay, let me introduce our guest. For this episode of the podcast, I had the opportunity to sit down with my friend, Laura Martin Gomez. Laura submitted her PhD thesis in 2020, and it was a fan study that examined groups in the US, the UK, and in France to look at how those groups were similar in ways, but also how they were a bit different. Since that time, Laura has served as the president of Tolkien Dill, which is the French Tolkien Society. So let's go ahead and dive straight into my interview with Laura. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to go ahead and dive right into the questions uh, and ask you the first one. uh, How were you first introduced to Tolkien's work? Um, As quite common, I think, for people my generation, I just um, saw the the trailer of The The Fellowship of the Ring uh, by Peter Jackson in 1902, something, 2001. Uh, at the time, and then uh, I really loved the trailer, um, the music, Legolas at the time. Well, I was 12, yeah. 13, so. Uh, and um, and then my, my dad said, there's a book. And as I was a huge, I mean, I loved reading at the time already. So uh, he just bought me the book and I read it before watching the movies. And then I just uh, dived into the rest of Tolkien's work after watching The Two Towers. I had a year in which I didn't really read Tolkien because I didn't really enjoy my first reading, actually. And then Mm. after watching The Two Towers, I was like, I really need to read this again. And then I just read everything that was available in French in the next few months and then began reading in English. Mm. Mm -hmm. So at that time... um how many kind of uh, years of English did you have under your belt? Was it pretty easy to understand Tolkien or st- was it still pretty difficult? Um, I didn't understand half of it. Uh, I had, I mean, my first, uh, my first uh, Tolkien book in English, in English was Romerandum. Uh, and I had been studying English for three years. So uh, to be honest, I think at the time I didn't understand much of it, but I loved I don't know. I I, thought, I I sort of heard the English in my head because I, I was used to to hearing English. So I didn't speak it, but I I heard English a lot. And so I had the music of Tolkien's you know style, and I loved it. Uh, and so I just you know read the history of Middle Earth a few years later. I was like fifteen or sixteen years old. I don't think I understand. I mean all of it, but I don't know. It just helped me improve my English and, and I just moved on from there and to become a teacher. And yeah. <laughs> well, to be fair, uh, I, I still don't think I understand all of the history of middle earth. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, it's also interesting that you actually were able to see the trailer for the movies before your first reading. Do you feel like, um, the, the characters that you saw in the trailers influenced <clears throat> the way that you pictured the, the characters in the text at all? I guess they did, but, I mean, it did, but uh, at the same time, I'm not a person that visualizes a lot in her mind. When I, I mean, when I read, I feel a lot, let's say emotions or, um, I don't know, sounds, whatever, but I don't see a lot. So probably that, probably, I mean, the characters are probably like the ones in the movies, in my mind, but I don't pay a lot of attention to it. I mean, it's not something that is um, that is very important when I'm reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you've already told us that you read, you've read, you know, uh, Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, Random, History of Middle Earth. You're very involved in the text. So if you had to pick a favorite part of the text, what do you think your favorite part would be? Um, to be honest, I really don't know. I really love. 
I mean, The Lord of the Rings is a masterpiece. Well, I'm talking to you, I mean, you, you all know that. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's not a, not a new information, let's say, new information. Um, it's just... I think the Lord of the Rings, uh, especially the Shire, talks to, I mean, speaks to my mind in the sense that uh, I feel that I could be like a hobbit in some aspects, you know, with them. Um, uh, I love my habits, my home, and at the same time, I love uh, going around, going on hikes and stuff. So I don't know. It's, it's, be, and at the same time, the, um, uh, the scoring of the Shire is, uh, very, to, to me, um, is tremendously contemporaneous. I mean, it, it really speaks to contemporaneous issues, and I don't know, I find it very powerful in a sense. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting because you and I have both done uh, kind of fan studies work, um, and so we, we've dealt a, a lot with people's opinions and views about the works, um, and I'm always struck by how many people from across the world feel at home in the Shire? Um, you know, there, there's something about the Shire that, that really resonates with our desire for kind of nature, simplicity, you know, rural but not difficult life. <laughs> yeah, true. And it's, it's also interesting to feel that it's at the same, it feels very English and at the same time, it's completely universal. And that's, I don't know, I find that very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, if I could remember correctly, there there was a professor that I had, an English professor, who would always say that uh, the personal is universal or something along those lines. Uh, if we can get down to kind of the core of our experience in some way, it, it resonates with other people. Uh, and I think Tolkien's managed to do that somehow. <laughs> um, so of all of the different times that you've come to Tolkien's work, is there one that stands out as maybe uh, your favorite experience of the work? Not really. I've been thinking about that and not really. What I, what I like maybe the most is the fact that it's something that I can rely on, something, uh, The Lord of the Rings especially. It's a book that I know I will go back to. I, I, I read it every year for many years and probably until my master's degree. And then, because of life and stuff, you know, I, I, I stopped reading it, or at least I didn't, re- I didn't read it every year. And then I, be- I picked it up again a few years back um, because I needed to read more and I needed comfort at some point. And, um, and from that point onwards, I've been, I think I've read it every two years. So that was seven or eight years ago. And so, I don't know, it's... Knowing that it's there and that at any point, if you feel low, uh, it's comfort right there. And uh, usually with a cup of tea, uh, standing in front of a window or outside if the weather is nice and it's just the best thing. Yeah. When you do go back to the text, do you find that you uh, start from the beginning and read through or do you just dive into a, a favorite part or two? No, I'm, I'm the type of person that likes going from cover to cover. I always open it on the first page and read it to the end, uh, except for the appendices, um, because it's not fiction. Well, it's not a, a tale, let's say, uh, per se, except the tale of Aragorn and Owen. Um, the Silmarillion, I've read some chapters on their own, uh, but more for research sake, let's say, or more for, you know, to just pick up something and um but yeah i'm more of a book book to book cover to cover person let's say yeah yeah absolutely um you know it's it's been really remarkable um the that kind of the public conversation particularly when when the pandemic started about um the number of people who are revisiting books and revisiting shows um because that's like you're talking about a, a, a source of comfort it's um, especially when things are unpredictable or insecure, it's it's something to uh, kind of soothe or or make you feel like you can depend on something. Um, so yeah, we've definitely seen a lot of people either um, revisit the books or maybe they were huge fans of the movies and they've come pick up the books for the first time. I've been really excited to kind of see that over the last couple of years. Um, have has have you witnessed that phenomenon kind of in your own circles? Um, 
I guess, yeah, I, I felt it, and I think I've, I've witnessed it sort of around me. And it's actually something that I really find I find really interesting, and I would love to be able to uh, like include in my future research at some point. I love the the, um, the attachment theory uh, by uh, Bowlby and uh, Ainsworth. I think it's uh, the, the woman who continued her his job, his work. Uh, I because it's it's about the attachment of children to some people, but I think we can relate this. I mean, we can sort of um, reuse the same idea and connect it to the attachment to stories and tales. And specifically, I think Tolkien is, to me, uh, Tolkien's work can really be an object of attachment in, as, a, as a story, as a tale, and, and so bring comfort in this sense. Wow, that's, that's really eye-opening for me because <clears throat> I was introduced to the attachment theory because we have a little kid now and, and uh, people have been talking a lot about, you know, you need to have uh, secure attachment and not, not, um, you know, intermittent attachment or, or, or things like that. So that he feels safe and secure in the world, regardless of the situation he's in basically. And I'd never considered applying that to literature. I think that would be fascinating. Yeah. I, I, that's something that's been going, you know, in the back of my mind for a few years. Uh, I really think it would be interesting. I'm, I'm not sure how far, I mean, how far I, I could go in the, the process, but I mean, it's would be difficult probably to prove or whatever, you know, to, to, to show. Uh, but I think it's a valid point. I mean, there, there's a uh, one psychologist in France that worked on uh, that published an article on um, detachment theory in the Lord of the Rings, but like from the point of view of the characters, and that was the first time that I, I mean, learned heard about this uh, this theory, and re it really made me think about how people relate to Tolkien's work, and so I really think there's something there that could be you know developed. Well, yeah. If you if you do develop that any further, please let me know. It sounds fascinating. <laughs> um, so while we're talking about <clears throat> research, this is a this is a good opportunity to ask you about uh, your Tolkien research that that you've done and that you're continuing to do. Um, so why don't you tell us tell our listeners a little bit about some of the Tolkien research you did through your schooling? Um, I actually have I've been quite stubborn in the fact that I really wanted to study Tolkien. So uh, when I did my, my first, my, my master's degree, so the master's degree in France is in like two different years and you have two different dissertations to hand in. And so in my first year of master's degree, uh, which I was doing specializing in um, British history, um, so I didn't have a choice, but so, so I had to work on British history. And so with my first year, I worked on how Tolkien and Lewis uh, changed the whole curriculum uh, at Oxford uh, when, when the, the curriculum to study English. Um, the second year of my master's degree, I worked on Tolkien's childhood in Birmingham. So I went to Birmingham a lot, exploring maps and stuff to just show where Tolkien lived and how his daily life might have been, must have been when he was, you know, eight, ten years old. And so that was me trying to shove in, you know, Tolkien inside history studies, historical studies, let's say. And then for my PhD, um, I worked on uh, their, uh, yeah, sort of, it's fun studies, sort of. It's uh, the reception of, of um, Tolkien's work by his fans. And I focused on the period before the internet. Um, I stopped around the centenary, the centenary, centenary sorry, 1992. Um, and focused primarily on a few communities, a few communities, yes, a few societies, because otherwise it would have been, you know, that huge. And uh, because I was doing it, my PhD was in comparative literature because we don't have cultural studies here, which would have been the perfect area. Um, I work, I focused on the US, the UK, and France. Uh, to compare these different areas because the reception, at least the history of reception of Tolkien is a lot, I mean, is very different in the US uh, and in the UK. So it was relevant, I think, to compare. And I obviously added France because I was working in France. <laughs> yeah. It, and when we first met, uh, I think we first actually met in person in Tolkien 2019. Um, and I became aware of your project. It, it fascinated me, obviously, because I, I'm also... Uh, really, really um, interested in in fan studies and, and researching that. Um, but in your 
um, comparison of the US, UK and France in terms of fandom. Um, do you think you could give us like a, a really short summary of what you think some of the biggest differences were? I know that's a, a challenging one because you wrote a dissertation about it, but <laughs> no, it's just also have to like, like think very quick and remember what I wrote about that. Um, um, in I think that in the U.S. there was a shift towards um, academic studies quite quickly. Um, at least an integration into academic studies very quickly because there were lots of um, uh, academics that were working on Tolkien from very early on. on. Uh, while in the UK, it took some time. Uh, and But there is some... I think there's the specificity of the, the, the British uh, fandom is was at least um, the, the, the privileged, to my point of view, uh, the privileged link with the Tolkien, uh, Tolkien family. Uh, the fact that uh, with the yearly event at Oxenmoot, they could meet with members of the family and also with uh, uh, the editors. That, for me, is something that makes uh, the British fandom uh, specific. Uh, or at least, I mean, it, it made them specific at the very beginning. I think today the differences are being blurred um, by uh, the internet. I mean, uh, they have been you know, changing these last 20 years. Um, as for France, uh, I think it's been uh, trying to find a middle ground uh, for 30 years, and uh, it's more or less gradually coming to terms with, you know, what it is being a fan and also being able to produce um, academic, you know, papers. Uh, but it, we are taught, um, Fr French fandom is quite small. So, and that's also an interesting thing to think about. Like, we are very... It's a small fandom compared to other uh, non-English speaking countries and in Europe, for example. Mm -hmm. So kind of thinking through your, your different periods where you were reading the book and, and um, now being involved with research and things, um, how do you think that your approach to Tolkien's work has changed over time when you read it personally? Uh as a teenager, I really looked for, um, I wouldn't say escapism because it's a bit too obvious, let's say, but I was looking for um, a moment when um, my imagination was not necessary, but was sort of, um, how can I say, fueled by uh, the story. So it's like, I didn't need to imagine anything, but the book gave me imagination in a way. And so, I mean, I was kind of, I was creative. What, what is funny, I think, is I was a creative teenager until I read Tolkien and then it dried up. Like I read Tolkien and suddenly I stopped, I stopped, I stopped writing, I stopped drawing, etc. because it was as if the, 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 the Middle Earth just became my imagination. It's, it's very strange. And so when the years went by, it just became, as I said earlier, some sort of, um, a story to which I go back. I go back to for comfort, and then depending on the way I feel when I read it, I look for different things, uh, obviously. But it's it's always and I always read it with um, my sort of um, my perspective as an English teacher. Also, I always I'm always looking to, for you know certain phrases and certain moments where. I just enjoy Tolkien's style. I mean, his poems are fabulous, for example. I really love them. And his descriptions are really nice. I don't know. It's just there's something that um, makes my perspective probably a bit different. But, I mean, it's just related to my job, let's say. But it's, it makes sense. I mean, as, a, as a professional sort of, of literature, it just changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting that, that you felt that your creativity kind of changed after reading Tolkien. Um, I remember after reading Tolkien for the first time and, and I was in middle school, um, I actually attempted to kind of write my own fantasy novel. Um, but it was very much just like, uh, here, here's Tolkien, let's do what he did kind of thing. I did that after reading uh, Harry Potter. So that was like two, year, two years earlier. I, I did some sort of similar, you know, attempt at writing a novel, but that, that was like Harry Potter. 
So. <laughs> um, my my mother was my first reader of my my story attempt, and she said this would make a great video game. And I was like, okay, well, that's it. That's the end of my literary aspirations. Then. <laughs> um, to her credit, she was trying to be encouraging, but I I took it to heart that I was not going to be the the next great literary genius. <laughs> Um, so after spending so much time with Tolkien, um, do you feel like you would recommend him to others and, and why or why not? Um, I think I would recommend reading. I mean, I, I recommend reading Tolkien a, a lot as, um, as a part of a Tolkien deal in France, because a lot of people come to us asking for recommendations. So usually it's for like young children and they come asking for like, I mean, asking, uh, what book is the best to begin, where should I begin, or what edition, or whatever. So we do a lot of recommendation. Um, but as, a, as an individual, I try, it's not that I try, it's just that I usually don't talk a lot about Tolkien in my, my life in general, outside of Tolkien fandom, or even outside of my research, I don't really talk about Tolkien a lot. But um, it happens that I recommend reading uh, Tolkien to some people. But usually, I know that some people are immune. So sort of. some people just don't, you know, dive into Middle Earth. Um, and most of the people who dive into Middle Earth stay there, sort of. And sometimes they go out and come back a few years later. And that's something that I observed in my when I was studying for my PhD. But um, some people never get inside you know and like my parents for example <laughs> they still don't really get it i mean they approve sort of and they, they encourage me and stuff but they don't really get it and um for my boyfriend the same he doesn't get it but that, that's okay and so that's why i don't really recommend it in the sense that i never i don't go around and talk about talking all the time actually so <laughs> yeah so um my, my last question is, you know, what, what are you working on now that, that is uh, Tolkien involved that, that our listeners could, could support or be involved with? Um, we've already mentioned Tolkien Dill a couple of times, so would you mind giving us a little bit more information about that to start off with, maybe? Um, yeah, so Tolkien Dill is a, as an association in France. Uh, it was founded in 2003, so we recently, in advance, celebrated our 20-year uh, anniversary um, for a couple of reasons. And um, so it's we are sort of we have been growing these last few years, and so we reached our hundredth uh, member uh, a few weeks back. So that's not a lot, as you can see. I mean, if you compare with the Tolkien Society, for example, or even the um, society in Spain, where uh, they or in Germany, they are a lot more than we are. Um, and we have a website that is uh, the reference in France, or in, I mean, for French people, it's the sort of the reference. And then we have, um, well, all of the social network pages, and we published a magazine that is like, it's like Malern in the 80s, let's say, or the, in the 90s. I mean, we work a lot on the um, the layout. I mean, the layout is excellent. And then the contents are a mix of various things, uh, including interesting, I mean, academic, sort of almost academic papers. Um, and so, and then we do festivals. So we have uh, a stand and... I don't know if you say a stand, but I mean, we, we are there with the books exposed and we sell our goodies and stuff and we, we talk about it to people. Um, and so that's it. And I've been president for two years now. We sort of waited for me to finish my PhD so that I could, you know, um, succeed uh, to Audrey Morel, who had been president for like 10 years before and wanted to stop. So I took over. And um, and so that's most of my of my work related to Tolkien today is related to uh, society, I mean, society's activities, let's say. It's whatever we have to do to keep this running, and that's what I do. Um, I try to do some research outside of Tolkien Neil, I try, but I don't have a lot of time. I sort of manage to give one or two talks a year, but... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in terms of your, your previous research, ha has any of the parts of your, your master's or your uh, doctorate been published anywhere yet? Um, that's a very recent and sort of a burning issue, let's say. I got, I have been expecting, 
to be published in a very famous uh, French uh, publishing house. And uh, they had me waiting for a year and a half, and they just decided eventually to turn me down last week. So that's very new uh, because they are just uh, sh shutting the collection of uh, essays, uh, shutting off, shutting off, uh, closing down the collection. Anyway, so I'm sort of trying to find now another uh, publishing house, another editor. And so hopefully it will be published uh, before next year. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I mean, it has been reworked because um, my, PhD, my initial PhD thesis is uh, 550 pages long and uh, now as a book it's like 200 pages long so it's I mean it's it has it sounds and it's readable I think for a large public um, audience um, so let me see otherwise I haven't published anything specific uh, I have published one article in English one paper uh, but that was uh, specifically on um, how um, English-speaking uh, papers, and I focus on Malern and myth. Uh, I have a, a huge gap. The paper, yeah, myth lore, sorry. Uh, and myth lore uh, had a sort of different trajectory, but went on to, became, to become sort of academic paper, um, review, uh, not review, sorry, journals, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> it's the end of the day. Uh, so, um, so, to answer to your question, not yet, but I really hope, and my, I mean, my big hope is to be able to publish my PhD in English, because I mean, most of what I talk about is about, I mean, English speaking fandom. So I think it would be of interest to a lot of, um, of English speaking fans. And so hopefully at some point after it's been published in French, I would be, I will be able to uh, publish it in English. So we'll see. I mean, I, I really think, I mean, there, there are a lot of anecdotes and stuff, I mean, and, and quotes and that are, I'm not very f well known, obviously. Uh, and so I think it would be nice to ha have it in English at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. So um, just like you'll, you'll have to circle back around if you extend your, your research on, um, on uh, connectivity, um, you'll also have to let us know if uh, when your when your uh, PhD stuff is published, so we can uh, let our let our listeners know about it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. It's it's been wonderful having you as a guest on the podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for your work on the Talking Experience Project. It's been very helpful uh, when I was doing my PhD, also. So that's that's nice for everyone involved. We are so thankful that we have such gracious scholars and fans who want to share the Tolkien experience with us and with you. We really enjoy making these podcasts and the fun doesn't stop here. That's right. It continues on social media. You can find us on Facebook as Tolkien Experience and Twitter as at Tolkien EXP. Don't forget to like, follow, share and comment because we love interacting with you just as much as we enjoy talking to our guests. For even more content, and to join our fellowship of supporters, check out our Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Tolkien Experience. Finally, you can also follow our personal Twitter accounts. I'm at Luke B. Shelton. I'm at SR Westwick. And I'm at Aaron L. Palmadil. If you have questions or comments, you can send them to us by email at tolkienexperience at gmail.com. If you want to know more about this week's guest, we provide show notes at TolkienExperience.com. You can find the podcast on all major podcast services, including Apple, Stitcher, and YouTube. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. Thank you for listening to our podcast, and we truly hope that, in a way, it contributes to your own Tolkien experience. <laughs>